Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. I'm your host, Mike Allen. Just imagine for a moment that your basement's got a dirt floor. You want to finish it off with concrete. So you dig down to level it off, but you strike a bone, then another one. And eventually, to make a long story short, four skeletons found buried in the same mass grave in your basements. Well, that's just what happened in Ridgefield, and those bones, 250 years old. Our special guest today got many such calls over the course of his career to investigate. Nick Bellantoni is state archaeologist emeritus, technically retired, but still extremely active. And in fact, he's still leading the investigation in Ridgefield. And wait until you hear this story. And now identifying four unearthed 250-year-old skeletons buried together. This is a mix between a real-life Halloween special and a Sherlock Holmes-style whodunit. You have to imagine for a second that you're living in a very, very old house. And under the basement, you've unearthed four skeletons while doing a reconstruction project. Well, this story involves four dead people who it's believed fought in the Revolutionary War Battle of Ridgefield. And while in a small way that gave away the punchline, wait until you hear how the state archaeologist emeritus Nick Bellantoni and his extremely talented support team of specialists are putting together all of these puzzle pieces. The skeletons were reported found at a construction site or an excavation site at some undisclosed location at a historic house along Main Street in Ridgefield, of which there are many. And then the police got a call, then you got a call. How did all that go? What they were doing is construction in the basement, the dirt floor basement of a house that was originally built in 1790. The house had been extended in the 19th century and then later on, once again, in the 20th century. And they were working, doing construction on the latter extension, the 20th century extension. And so what they were going to do is cement the floor. And so in order to do that, they needed to grade the the dirt down. They graded about, you know, 18 inches or so. And they hit human remains. They hit a skeleton. The the workers recognized it right away, called the property owner. The property owner contacted the police. The Ridgefield Police Department came in, saw the remains. They immediately contacted Chief's Medical Examiner's Office here in Connecticut, and which sent their forensic anthropologist out to take a look at what might have been found. So this started off really as as a crime scene investigation, thinking that maybe there was a hidden remains of a modern homicide or missing persons in the basement. When the forensic anthropologist went out there and took a look at it, realized uh, because of the condition of the bones, uh, it was kind of decomposing. These were probably reflecting a burial of some sort. By state statutes, the state archaeologist is called in whenever the remains are 50 years old or more and may have more of a historic background than a criminal uh, background. And so that's when we got the call. Now, I'm assuming, going out on a limb here, this is not the first time you've gotten such a call, but how unusual are these types of calls? I'd say in my tenure as state archaeologist, we probably got calls from the medical examiner's office and the state police maybe three, four times a year. Now, sometimes we got called in and they turned out to be animal bones, which we were able to identify and put that thing to rest. But in most cases, they were, in fact, human and either part of unmarked Native American burials or, in most of the cases, uh, colonial historic graves that nobody knew existed at those locales. Not everybody got a tombstone in history, and you do modern construction or some kind of land use and human remains come out of the ground. When you think about the job that you do, you get called, you come to the site. What is it that you encountered and what is it you're looking for when you step into that basement? When I got the call and they they told me about the location and I started driving down from the university to Richfield, my mind was wandering a bit. I was aware of the Battle of Richfield. And in fact, years before I had uh, been involved in doing some ground penetrating radar in the area, 
because of working with historians, this discussion of the possibility that there were mass graves of victims of the battle who had died on the battlefield and were immediately buried in mass graves. There had been this discussion within the town historical community, and we had gone out there and had done some radar, but we never really satisfactorily located it. So when I'm driving down, I'm saying to myself, my goodness, I wonder if this is the possibility of, you know, this revolutionary war victims. Now, I try to erase that from my mind because you don't want to have preconceived notions when you get out there. You really are starting with a blank slate. You just want to be able to get out there, observe, and then start making some references, assumptions, and so forth. But I, this was in the back of my mind. So when we went into the basement, there was only the remains of the one individual, for which the, you know the medical examiner uh, turned over for to the state archaeologist for further investigation. So that's when we started to do some more work there, because the question was, what had they found? One theory was that this might have been a farming family burial ground right off the old house that was now inadvertently covered. So when we worked a little bit further, lo and behold, a second individual comes up. And so that's when we really started to look at this, because now we were getting multiple individuals that so we had two hypotheses at that at this time. Was this a family graveyard or could these be victims of the Battle of Ridgefield? Now, since you were there and playing devil's advocate a little bit here, there's now been a third and a fourth. And I'm just wondering whether those thoughts that you pushed aside as you were driving down to the scene are maybe creeping back in. Is this something maybe you have stumbled across what was maybe considered a mass burial grave? Yes, well put. That's exactly what happened, because when we uncovered the second one, we uncovered the third one, and then a fourth one, and they were in a common grave shaft, okay? So this was, in fact, a mass burial. These weren't individual grave shafts. These uh, individuals were all laid in the same shaft. It was haphazardly done. It wasn't a nice, crisp, you know, grave shaft down vertical, you know, horizontal. This was kind of just dug quickly. You could tell by the soil stains. And also the individuals were overlapping each other. That means to say they were commingled. Arms and legs were overlaying each other. So it really was a rush situation, as you, you could see. And then just doing the demographics of the skeletons as we were working. You know, this is before we were able to go into the laboratory for more detailed skeletal analysis. It was pretty apparent, we could tell right in the field, that these were all adult men in about the ages of 20 to 40. You know, that would have to be confirmed in the laboratory. But in the field, we could make some observations that these were adult men and adult men of very good stature. So these were good, strong, young men. If you're doing a cemetery, if you're doing a burying ground, you're going to get women, children. You're going to get a different kind of demographics, especially children, because many died young in those days. These were all adult men. That really resurrected, if you will, the idea that we were dealing with Revolutionary War battle victims. One thing that I found, I guess, intriguing was the fact that as haphazard as it was, they were still buried in a certain direction with their heads to the west and their feet to the east. Do I have that right? You absolutely do. And uh, they were buried with what we would say a Christian mortuary practice. Christians buried their dead in an east-west orientation head to the west, feet to the east. So as you laid in, in your grave, you literally face the east. And the idea of the judgment, the resurrection, Jesus will come up uh, with the sun and literally draw you from your housing and you will join in the resurrection. When you go to the old graveyards in New England, 17th, 18th, 19th century, and even into the early 20th century, People are laid in that specific way. So this was the actual orientation we found these young men in. So they were adhering to Christian patterns, even though it was a rushed burial on a battlefield. 
Now, something else that, you know, somebody like me, I would jump to a conclusion, and I'm sure part of the expertise that you have is to be very uh, deliberate in your approach. But when I heard that they found buttons uh, that looked like they may be from a uniform, well, my mind immediately jumped to the conclusion you have found soldiers. How do you deal with something like that, a find like that? One of the things we're conscious of is looking for material culture, buckles, buttons, anything that can associate with the individual, even some fragments of organic remains that may be textile or, or something. What we found of the four, two were completely naked, if you will, or at least with clothing that did not survive, but they had no boots or buckles. And they were completely stripped. And we do know that that was a common approach on battlefields at Lexington and Concord up in Massachusetts. When British soldiers fell, in some cases, they dug them shallow graves to put them in, but they were sure to strip them of their uniforms, their armaments, their everything, because those were very valuable. And they weren't going to just leave those back on the field. But two of the individuals that we uncovered clearly had waistcoats or shirts or jackets on because we did find, as you mentioned, a series of buttons coming down the center chest cavity, if you will. Another one had more elaborate buttons. Those buttons were on the arm and the sleeve as well as along the breast. So we were thrilled because one of the things we would be looking for now is what are the nature of these buttons. Now, when we were recovering them in the field, these were corroded beyond recognition of any insignia or anything that might be on them. So once we got them to the laboratory, we were able to then clean them and then conduct photographing and so forth. To our disappointment, it turns out that none of the buttons are regimental. They're plain buttons that anybody could have been wearing. However, we do know that the Patriots, our militias were going in to intercept the British, and literally guys were coming off the field, farmers, they were coming off the fields, out of their houses, coming to help defend. This was early in the war, before we were even blue coats. You know, the guys were wearing their clothes, what they had on. It could be that this is uh, an indication that these were not English, but in fact, patriots who had fallen and were buried on the battlefield. Now, I'm saying that prematurely, because this is all going to wait until we have all the forensic analysis done. So until we really have all of the DNA and uh, a stable carbon isotope and life histories and traumas and so forth, we're going to be a little premature in saying who they are. But uh, the working hypothesis is that these might be patriots. Let me just say also, it's not likely that these are a farm family burial ground, not only because of the demographics of, of them being all men, but in those days, you didn't bury your dead with clothing. Clothing was much too expensive. So that, you know, people were buried uh, naked uh, traditionally and maybe covered with a sheet or a shroud, but not clothing. Clothing was hand woven. It was expensive. You handed that down to brothers and sisters. The fact that they were still wearing some clothing, again, is a suggestion that this was a very hasty, immediate burial. Your forensic team if I have this right, uh, consists of five different prominent universities. You mentioned Yale, UConn, Quinnipiac, University of Florida, U UCLA, and Santa Cruz. I assume they all bring something to the table in terms of specialty expertise? That's exactly right. Quinnipiac, for example, will be doing diagnostic imaging, doing CT scans of not only the artifact, but each skeletal element. When they're done, we'll have a three-dimensional model of each one of these individuals. Florida is going to be doing stable carbon isotope analysis. What that does, it will give us a sense of the diet of each individual, the first 20 years during growth and development, and even the last 20 years of their life. Your bones and teeth take in what you eat, and we can reconstruct that. The researchers might be able to distinguish between American diets and European diets, which might help us distinguish who's who. 
uh, University of Connecticut is going to be doing the DNA. They may be all British, whether they're Americans or English of British ancestry. However, we may have African Americans or Native Americans also here. And also with the DNA, if we get good markers, we can compare those markers to uh, these DNA databases that are now available to us. And there is the possibility, a long shot, that we might be able to link up family genetics to some of these individuals and actually maybe get um, good positive indications of names and families and then start doing some of the historic research with some of the individuals we have. Now, I understand that the British government is not necessarily looking over your shoulder, but is uh, certainly interested in this. And, you know, the working hypothesis seems to indicate it's probably not British soldiers. But if it were, would the remains have to go back to them? We've been in communication with uh, military authorities on what we have and so forth. It turns out that the British, you know, the British Empire, the sun never set. And as a result of that, they fought battles all over the world, and they have fallen soldiers all over the world. And the preference, from what I understand from them, is that they prefer to leave them where they have fallen. If they do turn out to be British, the British certainly will be involved in the military honors of the reburial, but they would be uh, very fine with them being reburied in the town of Ridgefield where they fell. From listening to you discuss this and the enthusiasm that you bring to this, you know, in terms of when you look over your career and, and things you've done with other cases, how does this rank and rate compared to others? This ranks very high and high for a number of reasons. Number one is we do not have many Revolutionary War battlefield burials that have been encountered and also have had good archaeological excavation techniques and these kind of analysis available. It's so unique and it's such a, um, an opportunity to look not only into uh, the history of the battle, but the participants themselves, their life history, their, you know, diseases they may have had and so forth, uh, and the traumas they suffered uh, during this. It's going to be you know, right up there, you know, uh, um, whether I put it number one or not, I'm not quite sure, but it's certainly right, right up there. Well, that wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. Once the work is over, and hopefully the soldiers are positively identified, they're going to get a full military honors funeral in the town where General David Worcester was killed, Benedict Arnold led the Patriot defenses, and an estimated two dozen soldiers were killed during the Battle of Ridgefield back in April of 1777. I want to very much thank my guest, Connecticut State Archaeologist Emeritus Nick Bellantoni, for providing this fascinating update. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Mm -hmm.